question was, how could you bring a service-oriented architecture into this C? Oh, well, I think they'll hear, don't you? No, it's better to put it. Is it? Okay. One moment, guys. Okay. So how do we make use and exploit this, this sea of information? Uh, our cast of characters for these programs included people from various communities that we were bringing together, such as Deb McGinnis, who did Damel Oil and Owl, uh, people from model-driven architecture, people from category theory like Robert Kent and Ben, ben uh, Ken Beklosky and Jeff Smith, um, uh, people from traditional logic and knowledge representation like John Soa, Joseph Gogan, who's no longer with us, but a Renaissance man and Renaissance mathematician at UCSD. Uh, oops. So, what do I mean, though, by interoperability with uniformity and conformity? On the left of this picture, this is slide number nine. Sorry, I haven't been telling you as I've been advancing. On the left, there's the totalitarian centralized model. You will connect through the hub. And even if you use a different formalism, that's OK as long as you convert it over to ours in a least common, least common denominator approach. On the right of slide 9 is more of a peer-to-peer, -peer, but no less totalitarian approach, where is you push decisions off to the network, but everyone has to use the same formalism. Let us not kid ourselves. As we advocate RDF as a possible universal healthcare exchange language, we are taking the right approach. Now, I'm one of the people the who's right the right side approach. The Thank approach, you. The approach Thank on you. The, right. the approach on the right. Thank you. That also has political connotations. Or east in this case. Right. So I'm one of the people who did sign the document that we put together a few weeks ago from David Booth at the workshop. And so I think that's a great starting place, but let us not kid ourselves that we're still following a traditional interoperability path. Go on to slide 10. The context of our movement, as we rethink on a foundational level, is that information technology over the past 60, 70 years, back since von Neumann built his computer at Princeton, has been going from a very mechanistic model at first <laughs> At first, individual cogs and gears, and then distributed processing, multiple gears working together, but still in a Newtonian framework. Uh, and then, now we're entering the era that back in 1998 we christened uh, computing fabrics, but it's a much more <coughs> living kind of model. And so I see this as the, the challenge of our era, how we're taking mechanistic models and moving them to become more like living systems, including ecologies and cultures and ecosystems. Slide number 11, we basically have a co-mingling of automated systems and humans, and humans who are communicating, intermediated through computing environments. Slide 12, there are key differences between interoperability between humans and interoperability between machines. And this is worth spending a moment on. On machines, you've got to program them in advance in order to facilitate their interoperation. Even in the era of DARPA programs, okay, OWL and RDF did not come out of nowhere. There was the DAML oil program in order to create a language by which computational distributed agents could talk to each other. But again, you had to define it to begin with. You could supplement it over time. On the other hand, humans, we learn from each other. We learn each other's lingos, even each other's different conceptualizations of the world, different worldviews, as we communicate. Okay? Machines require instructions. We humans can point to examples. A French speaker and an English speaker use different words and different conceptualizations the way we think. Us, us Americans, we just think bigger is better. And the French maybe are more sophisticated. They're not just bigger is better. They might classify things in more subtle ways. Ambigu ambiguity doesn't compute in machine processing. On the other hand, we humans are able to use analogy, metaphor, and a term that was introduced 
by a group here at UCSD, Conceptual Blending. Uh, that being Gilles Fauconet and his partner out at Case Western, I think. Um, what's his name? Mark, whatever. Uh, and then formalized by Joseph Gogan using a, an extension to category theory called the theory of institutions and institution morphisms. The point is, we don't just use very rigid concrete examples. We're able to make wild extrapolations and adaptations. You, uh, computers, until we compu uh, create a computational embodiment of these techniques like con conceptual blending, they're not able to. Computers, you ask them a question, they don't know the answer, they stonewall, or they think they know the answer. We, we negotiate with each other, sometimes to the point of ridiculous time waste. Uh, they're static and rigid. We self-adapt. Their language changes, the computers, with very periodic changes based on committees, standards committees, national, de facto, etc., glacial changes. I know John's probably looking at me smiling thinking, HL7. But we don't need John to comment on that. I will just make my own comment. Um, our languages are in constant flux. There's no static language to natural language. They're always changing and adapting. And just think about what texting on phones has now done to the common language. Uh, also, computing systems need to be re-engineered. Re we culturally evolve. Can I just add a term? Oh, yeah. A temporal impedance mismatch between human communication and machine communication. Yes, a temporal oh, impedance machine. mismatch between okay. human and computer communication. I'm not going to ask you to define temporal impedance, but we'll do that after a few more classes. So we're going to slide 13. <laughs> what are the key principles that I'm advocating here or putting on the table to enable interoperability, meaning exchange of healthcare information and knowledge without uniformity and conformity? So the key thing is, each node, that could mean each language, <laughs> each computing system, each database, needs to not be static, but needs to be able to alter itself, to expand itself. If you and I want to talk about some subject, if we're not already sharing exactly the same knowledge, so if we did, why would we want to communicate? We need to expand. We need to have each person teach the other what they know. Based on that expanded repertoire, we can then communicate and actually move our knowledge forward. So there's three ways of, of bringing this to bear. One is a language, a computing language that's living. And I don't mean just programming, but more for knowledge, representation, and reasoning that can evolve and learn as we <laughs> use them. Uh, another is languages that are designed from the outset to liaise with each other, to communicate which means rather than mapping between languages, between ontologies, between models, being an afterthought that is done occasionally, or worse, is standardized in committee at that glacial pace or after languages get iterated, instead it becomes something that happens all the time. So we design them to do that. And one approach to that is this third bullet, which is rather than focusing on new languages, we focus on mathematically based language machines that can do mapping. What do I mean by it? So one of our workshops in TIA was called How the Stack Stack Up. And I think it's rather ironic that this workshop began exactly 10 years ago yesterday. Sort of funny. And we brought all of the experts we could find into the same room to represent the various points from meta modeling at the object management group, the semantic web stack, including Deb McGinnis and Sheila McElrath, uh, the information flow framework, which is a category theory based interoperability and modeling framework from Bob Kent up north of Seattle, or is it south of Seattle? and then the logic-based languages, such as your traditional things like KIF, your newer OWL, um, Psyche and PsycL, et cetera. And John Sowell was representing that stack. And the most amazing thing of that workshop, we went in assuming everyone was going to stonewall and disagree, and instead everyone admitted that their system did not solve all the problems. We needed to put our brains together and do a Vulcan mind meld, that was great, but when you started talking to their disciples, it's a religious war. 
the originators, they're free thinking. You get down a level and everything's frozen in concrete. <coughs> so what we did is we worked an example problem. So a very concrete problem, because we didn't want to just stay in the ivory tower of mathematics. We had to, this, this was under DARPA's TIA program. This was a form of not pure research. We were expected to get results. So to have an example that we could share with people outside the intelligence communities, we came up with this example where we had two different languages. And by the way, for people on the phone, slide 15. We had two languages. In UML, the Unified Modeling Language, which is based on the Meta Object Facility MOF, we used that to represent a system called Open Buying on Internet, which was an early XML vocabulary for doing e-commerce. In OWL-DL, so the description logic of OWL-1, we use that to uh, model the unified business, unified or universal, universal business language. And of course, we had various models and data that subscribed and conformed to these two different things, which are represented on the left and the right. What we had to do was come up with a mapping, not a human-generated mapping, but an automated mapping between these systems realizing that we would have to expand it to a very heterogene heterogeneous space where your schemas, your models, your languages, even your logics are different. Hard problem. And again, we couldn't, if we go to slide 16, we couldn't say, oh, well, human will do it. That's how it's done today, even with a nice graphical user interface. One of the ideas was, uh, I remember this lovely drive where we were having a dinner out of, after one of our workshops at Raytheon, and we were all in a big van, and John Soa says, we're going to call it Miracle. And it turned out that acronym it had, it, yeah, right, didn't, didn't quite yeah. stick, but we ended up with magic for managed logic, <laughs> since logic was at the top of our pyramid. The idea being that since it's mathematically grounded, there could be multiple implementations and embodiments of these language machines. We're not legislating one central approach. But by defining a community's language, a new one or redefining an existing one in the system, bridges between all the other languages so defined could be derived and automated. So that's just a high level idea. One of the things that really grabbed my attention. Next slide, thank you. Set slide 18. Uh, I found uh, some work out in Europe, specifically out of Barcelona, although I never got a trip there. Uh, a couple of guys, one named Marco Schorlemer and another Janis Kaflaglau, and I'm probably really screwing up Kaflaglau's name, looked at how do you get French speakers and English speakers to align their worldviews, where on the right side of the slide, we have French speakers categorizing bodies of water by how they flow. Are they stagnant? Do they flow? Does a flowing body of water flow into a basin? Does it flow into another flowing body of water? And then we crude Americans, is it big or is it little? Okay. Uh, well, anyway, the idea behind this thing called IFMAP, and the IF is information flow. So a little, just a moment's backstory there. Back in the 90s, there are two fellows uh, over at Stanford Center for Language, the Study of Language and Information, John Barwise and Jerry Seligman. Actually, I think Jerry was somewhere else. And so they were looking at creating a category theory-based form of distributed knowledge systems. In fact, I'm holding up the book here. This is their book, Information Flow. Very interesting book at the end speculating on relations to quantum logic. Well, they applied this technique, and then Marco Schorlemer and Janis Kaflaglau decided to try to actually create a computational embodiment, not just write papers. And they actually succeeded to a large success, and that was called the IFMAP program. And that motivated me, but there were a few things missing. It was their techniques of doing it were not scalable to the kinds of volume of data that you would have in an intelligence program. It used very custom programming as opposed to relational database management systems in SQL. Uh, I could go on and on. You know, it's a laboratory prototype, not something to go into production. 
So we started looking at systems. On the next slide, slide 19, I've got two fairly isomorphic mathematical approaches. The information flow of Barwise and Seligman on the top and the Chu spaces, first uh, by Peter Chu, uh, a student in the area, I forgot who his professor was, and now though the, the flag bearer of this is Vaughn Pratt, also at Stanford at the Center for the Study of Language and Information. And it turns out that these two systems are relatively the same, but with a key difference. You'll notice that in both of them, they're both about how types of things get class tokens get classified as of types, and how you can map across classification systems. Uh, where you're doing it in information flow, you're using principles from category theory, things like morphisms and functors. But down in two spaces, you've got a tabular rep representation, not only of the states, the two spaces themselves, but the transformations between different spaces can be represented as another space, a table. So now you can use a relational database in SQL to not only process your, your spaces, but your transformations as well. Uh, a very nice portable system, given how well SQL has become standardized. So I'm now going to fly through the following slides, starting on number 20, just <laughs> to show you how tangible this is, not just ivory tower. What we have here is for that problem a few slides back where we have the open buying on internet rope represented in UML and we want to create, derive a mapping of that into universal business language represented by OWL DL. What we have here is we've got two spaces representing a common set of instances. Again, the French and English speakers, in order to communicate, they point to common examples. I call that a river, fleuve, and don't, I'm bastardizing French because I don't speak it, but don't ask me about the body of water that flows and flows into a flowing body because I will really screw that one up. But what we've done here is taking common instances which are represented by the rows on slide 20 and looked at them in each of the space. You can think of it as the left side or source space, uh, the, the, uh, the effectively UML OBI space, and below it, the target space, which is your OWL DL being used to represent your universal business language. So you can represent that. We can then merge these spaces. Again, I'm not spending time on the mathematics. Slide 21, we can merge these spaces. On slide 22, we can now derive the lattice. So this is a Galois lattice. That's what it's called. And the, the visualization of it is called a Haas diagram. But what this tells us, and this is Boolean subset logic. So this is not partition logic, per se. It would be interesting to see what this would look like in partition logic. But in subset logic, what we've derived here using these common instances is that a UML class and a UML attribute are both subtypes of OWL DL classes. But an OWL DL property is something altogether different. And in effect, that distinction is a, and I'm going to put this word in scare quotes, is a partition of the space. And we were thinking of it as a partition before we learned of David's partition logic here. So I'm really interested in re-exploring this. Slide 22, the, the relationships that were visualized in that Haas diagram is this language map. And the language map in Chu space nomenclature has two parts to it. There's two functions. One goes in one direction from source, from source types over to target types. And then there's a contravariant function on the bottom that goes from target tokens back over to source tokens. I'm only showing you the top part of the map here. But this basically tells you what maps into what. So given that now, we go to slide 24. We can take that, <laughs> represent these two maps, and represent them as a two space itself for processing using SQL. If we then go to slide 25, we now are going to go from the language map, which was, again, just to reinforce this, UML to OWL DL. We're now going to go down a meta level, down into our domain map. So this is more in the area of ontologies and models. And so now we just record what 
a sort of taking inventory of what we've got. Slide 26 is taking inventory of what we've got over on the right side with universal business language, again in terms of OWL DL. 27, we now have the domain, this is, this is key, this is one of the innovations of this method. We look at the domain map, that is the subject matter, we're talking about business line items and purchase invoices, in the context of the language map that we just derived. Because the language map creates a partitioning of the space into the class kind of things and the property kinds of things, that means we now have two domain maps to do. One related to class-like things, one related to property or predicate-like things. And so, again, the use of this word partition on slide 27 is this is from 2006 and needs to be updated in context of the meaning of partition that David Ellerman has introduced. Go to slide 28. Now we are looking at these domain chew spaces for your open buying on internet, Slide 29 is similarly for open buying on internet and UML, the other side of the partition, the relations. Slide number 30, we now merge these two spaces again because this is where we're doing the alignment, the mapping. And then we start uh, concretizing that. So it's sort of like we've got the, the substance there and now we want to figure out what's the structure there. Uh, we go on to slide 32 and we've got another Haas diagram representation at the domain map level of those things that are class-like. So now we know, for example, uh, a, P a PO104, presumably purchase order. We're not looking at the syntactic tags at all. Those are other approaches to ontology alignment. We're just looking at the relationship, the classifications of, of tokens to types. So here, that's saying uh, if you count over uh, those in the center, in the rank number one of the lattice, from left to right, the fourth one, <coughs> PO104 unit price, aligns in OBI to the concept of price amount over there in UBL. And then if we go to slide number 33, uh, it's very simple on the relation lattice what the mapping is. We go to slide 34, and now we have the top parts of both maps, the language map and the domain map that have been derived autonomously. Again, using common instances. And realize this, since we've been talking about DOD and VA and Kaiser, there is a lot of data on classifications of tokens to types. So in terms of looking for common instances, even best would be even common patience. There's lots of inferences that could be made there. Go to slide 35. <clears throat> this is just saying that that approach that worked across two meta levels, the level of language definition, the language of ontology, can be extended down to support a model layer, models whose, whose elements conform to an ontology that are defined in a language, going up the meta levels. Slide number 36, we can push it down all the way. So in terms of those familiar with the MOF, the meta object facility of the OMG on which UML is based, this is their whole meta modeling hierarchy from what's called M3 at the top to M0 at the bottom. And if we go to slide 37, the approach is extendable at least to hub and spoke if not hub and Spock models where we can have uh, hub languages and hub ontologies, et cetera. And if we need to, to support, and I'm looking at Tom right now, if we have to support that old way of thinking where we've got centralization like in DOD and VA, at least we can map between these hub languages and ontologies. And we don't have to have humans doing it. Uh, go to slide number 38. One of the key and hard problems in this space is figuring out what are the set of elements and attributes and items, the knowledge items that you have to use, you basically, to do a mind meld between source and target or multiple parties to identify what is the smallest set of elements you need 
to create something that's not a least common denominator integration. And that's where our knowledge surveying technology comes to bear. We originally introduced it and developed it where what you've got a user, an information searching user, an information seeking user, who has one conceptualization of the world that they're bringing to the table, all their knowledge, their presuppositions, their presumptions. And then you've got an information resource, a database, a search engine that has its own implicit conceptualization of the world. And in order to fully achieve information superiority, to literally let that user exploit that information resource, you need to bring their two worldviews together. And it's knowledge surveying that allows us to do that. Um, for the slide 39, for the chief architect of GSA, General Services Administration, what I just outlined was just the first step on the roadmap. We then had, and, and I love what, what, what George, the, the, their chief architect, say, it's a roadmap with a road. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we looked at how you could build and extend that, effectively taking the mathematics and making them more flexible so that you don't have to do alignment all at once. You can start doing some part of it. And then as things evolve, your set of tokens, your set of types, your constraints, you can progressively add to these alignments without redoing it. That's in stage two. In stage three, start of creating these language machines. And then in stage four, we were looking at this open-ended collection. This is a really hard problem. Not as hard as the scientific basis of consciousness, but really hard. And on there, how can you have an open-ended collection of meta-mathematics that this, the language machine can bring in and support? Um, la next to last slide, number 40. Uh, this was some thoughts. I'm, of course, not going to try to brief this right now, of how we were looking at using partial orders and institutions in order to partition up these mathematics and the space of languages. So you could literally have <laughs> language and logic components, ontology components, model components in a quasi-repository and literally define languages based on systems of these components so that you could automate some of the computation of creating the bridges. What's a concern space? Ah. So that comes from the, there, there's been a field, you're familiar with object-oriented programming. Uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot of work to move forward with aspect-oriented software design, where it was acknowledged that an object hierarchy in Java or whatnot imposed a straitjacket on the world. And then some things like printing functions, reporting, et cetera, had functions that would cross cut all of those are concerns that would cross cut 80 or 90% of your objects, which meant if you wanted to maintain that code, you had to touch everything. And the idea of object orientation was to encapsulate. And that broke the encapsulation model. So there was uh, the Java community down at PARC, the Palo, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. They created one model of aspects, uh, an asymmetric model. People at IBM Research, the Hyper-J community, created a symmetric model, and they introduced the word concern. And so we started looking at that symmetric model for how you can define these defined concerns and compose them. And I think I only have. Oh, yes, I have one more slide. And this is a change of subject, sort of a segue onto tomorrow. But I just feel it's so important. I want to get into community. I want to hear Tom's thoughts and John's thoughts and anyone else. And that is, a few years ago at HIMSS, I heard a very oversubscribed talk. Uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and someone doing natural language recognition. They were all concerned about how in today's EMRs, you could represent these very common ideas. Like, what if you have a patient who has anemia? But it's not just anemia as any primary condition. It's anemia as a result of end-stage renal failure. And the best that their EMR, I think this was at UPMC, could do is, well, you could put in a comma-delimited list of snow med codes for the various conditions. But that left it as ambiguous. Well, what was the relationship between these? Did they just co-occur and come into existence simultaneously? Well, it turns out that if we're adopting RDF, even without any OWL constraints at all, 
It's very easy using subjects, predicates, and objects to identify both with SNOMED codes and I'll say more general ontology concepts, upper ontology concepts, that you end up having renal failure as a, anemia as a result of renal failure. So why are we talking about problem lists rather than problem graphs? And to just extend that further, over on the right on this slide, number 41, is a picture of one of my favorite little articles in science back from, I don't know, 2000, 2001, at the early part of systems biology called Life's Complexity Pyramid. And I saw this and I just got so turned on. The idea was, how do we understand even things like humans as a hierarchical, tangled thicket of life? going from the bottom, which may be below the genetic genomic level, all the way on up to organ systems with pathways, signaling pathways, metabolic pathways in between. So I would think by now, at least on the life sciences part of the translational divide, those researchers are saying, a problem list? We're talking about very complex graphs. So it seemed to me, as we're talking about healthcare languages, not just for exchange, but for representation, we need to be capturing things, not just coded, but proper knowledge representations, which involve the graphs or the interstitial fabric. And that's where I'm going to shut up. Can I? Can I um, Please. So first of all, this is brilliant. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> Could you repeat that? Yeah, first of all, it's brilliant. Okay. Um, and it resonates very much with my journey. We're, what, I, what I alluded to in my earlier comments briefly is the fact that um, as Mike Snyder of Stanford, uh, Chair of Genetics at Stanford, and, and many others have said, there is no such thing as a common disease. It does not exist. If you look at the array of SNPs for common diseases like diabetes or hypertension, there are scores of SNPs known today and there will be many more known soon. And as the interaction of those with the immune system and the microbiome and the diet and the environment and the, your telomere count and yada, 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 that, that determines what actually a disease is. And so in that context, um, the uh, metadata about individual data points that contribute to a specific observation about an individual is inherently complex. And what we've done in our reductionism of health records in SNOMED and ICD and CPT is a reductionism um, that is, it fits with conventional models and textbooks of medical science, but it's going to be blown apart within the next couple of years, absolutely completely undermined and blown apart um, by what's emerging out of genomics and metagenomics and um, all, all of the various um, omics that, that are driving things. So even if we tried to model what's happening today, all of the points you made are valid. But what's going to expose all that very abruptly is the understanding of how if you've seen one genome, you've seen one genome. If you've seen one person with diabetes, you've seen one person with diabetes. And so this notion that we can code diabetes as 250.00 is, is massively obsolete. And as you know, uh, there are already companies that, uh, startups that are emerging around pharmacogenomic uh, 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 mass personalized um, care mass customized personalized medicine and precision medicine. And so in that context, um, the ability to do the reduction, reductionist um, uh, unique concept model um, is not going to work. And my comments earlier about what is the purpose of your data representation and, and, and how do you match the, the semantic <coughs> solution to the purpose that you're you're intended to, to work on in these communities of interest that Gio Wiederholt refers to. Communities of interest are organized around purpose. And so there are always, just like there are many different languages, and even if the web created a single universal language, English or otherwise, there is going to be perpetual dialectical variation because of the asymmetry of the rate of evolution around specific concepts based upon local experiences, and there's, it's this trade-off between local, local specialization and global generalization, which, you, which that diagram alludes to is arrows on the right and left are generalizations mm -hmm. and specializations. So those are universals. There's also the trade-off between uh, the classical trade-off and representations between uh, reproducibility and expressivity. And so uh, certain things are much richer in their expression and, and, and generally speaking, images are more expressive than text. 
um, but but there's some limitations there. And um, where where I'm going with all this is that I don't believe the question is how do we have a universal representation. I don't think, for all the reasons you articulated, that that's a realistic target state. I think the target state is how do we understand that there are going to be multiple models of represent representations linked to specific purposes that must interoperate in some way. So the example you gave of buying on the internet is a classic and useful example because the units of measure in that context are dollars and cents, uh, minutes and seconds, debits and credits, and then some der derivative formulas. It's very simple and it's very discreet. However, when you get to, into the human experience, the diversity of data types and schemas within those data types is so great that when you start to think about the transformations of how you do dollars and cents in one schema with dollars and cents in another, you can be very uh, faithful in your mapping of the semantics and the, and, the and the unique concepts between one schema and another. You can't do that in the richness of the human experience, which is everything, everything we perceive and sense and feel and, and, and think. And, and so my point is that, that one of the goals 